think about it. That was a commercial from 1993, which a Pepsi, a Pepsi commercial featuring Shaquille O'Neal. And in that commercial, he was squaring off with a young boy who was seven years old, Milton Davis, who stood at three feet, 11 inches tall. And compare that to Shaquille O'Neal, who was seven foot one and at 300 pounds. And that commercial pitted this battle that here it was, that Shaq just dunked the ball and he was going over to get a drink, which you see in the commercial, some of the kids went and grabbed their, the last few out of the case. And this one kid was just standing there with his Pepsi and Shaq wanted it. And he told him, don't even think about it. Well, are there things that we value, just as how it's pictured in that commercial where this little kid faces a giant, and he valued so much that drink he had in his hand that he was willing to tell him, don't even think about trying to take this from me. And are there things that we face in our lives that we want to stare down these giants, but we want to preserve the things that we hold? It begins with a mindset, though. It has to you have to have determination, you have to have the desire, the purpose-driven mind, the focus, because it doesn't just come naturally. If it's something, there's some goal, some thing in mind that you want to achieve, you have to show its manifestation that you really value it in your actions. Matthew 15, I don't have a slide for this, but it tells of this parable that Jesus was giving with his disciples. And it was at a point where the, the people around at the time, the Pharisees and the teachers, they accused his disciples of not washing their hands and so on. They were focused on all these little things. And just to go into the meat of the story here in verse 17 of Matthew 15, he's given them an indication of what is exactly is clean and what is not. And he says to them in verse 17, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and these things are what makes a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false testimony. These are the things that make a man unclean. So he focuses them on that. And Proverbs 4 tells us, you know, since Jesus is saying that out of your heart come evil thoughts, it says to guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. And the issues that we focus on that flow out of us, or you know, things that we are concerned about, we're concerned about our work, or about school for some people, our relationships, about what we eat, what we wear, all those things that the Father knows that we have need of. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh, so he is. So if we're thinking about these things, they occupy a lot of our time. Now, there's some research that was done, I think, in the Newsweek um, publication just in July this year. There are a group of psychologists and so on from Queen's University in Canada that they, they did a study, a cognitive neuroscience study on how many thoughts people have every day. They couldn't figure out what thoughts, but they did these studies and they found out that in their estimation that we have over 6,200 thoughts per day. Now, how many of those thoughts you think are good? And how many 
are evil. Let's hope not a lot. And if we think that our thoughts, our conversations are always secure, remember, we have an adversary who's been around for thousands of years. And he's tempted every single man and woman that has lived on this earth. Even the one that's lived the longest, Methuselah. He lived 969 years on the earth. So if we do a rough calculation, not counting his early years, of how many th times you think he would have been tempted while he lived. I came up with a number of, if we just use an estimation of one temptation per day, it will be well over 300,000 temptations he's faced. And just, just based on one temptation per day. Now compare that if he had 6,000. That's a big number. But this adversary that we face, he doesn't want us to be in God's kingdom. 1 Peter 5 says, verse 8, that he is a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. And in 1 Corinthians 10, we read here, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now the phrase, don't even think about it from that commercial, it could be applicable to so many situations, even here in the Bible. How about when the serpent was tempting Adam and Eve? What if Eve had said, hey, don't even think about it? And what if Adam had said when she wanted to give him the fruit, don't even think about it? Wow, what a different 2020 we could have had if only sin did not enter through the first man. How about Cain and Abel? What if he didn't think about killing his brother? How about those Israelites who were rescued from slavery in Egypt? And that's recorded in Exodus 32. I don't have time to go through it, but you can go through it from verses 1 to 28. How long did it take them to look for their own gods, where they went and cast all of their gold and jewelry to make a golden calf and say, well, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. What if Aaron had told them, don't even think about it. 3,000 of them wouldn't have died in one day. Isaiah 58 does give us some hope and some inspiration. In verses 8 and 9, of Isaiah 50, 55 actually. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Wow, that's reason for some hope there. Aren't we glad that we serve a God that his ways are higher than ours, that his thoughts are higher than ours? Aren't we glad we serve a God who is so perfect, who is so infinitely wise, who is so infinitely merciful, and he also wants us to be like him? And in his wisdom, he has preserved for us examples of the lives of others who have lived on before us who have also struggled, yet their deeds and their words are recorded for us to ponder and for us to learn from. Satan tested one such individual. His name is Job. You know his story pretty well. In all my years in the church, I've never met anyone who's been in the church who has said, I'd want to trade places with that guy. 
No one wants to take up the things that he went through. And even after undergoing his trials, he would look and he would write something and, and it's recorded for us because he faced his own giants in his time. He lost his house. He lost his children, he lost his livelihood, even his own flesh was tormented. And he would inspire these words, Job 23, verses 10 to 11. And he says, but he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. So he's impl implying there that there is a way to follow without turning aside. There is a direction to going, a right path. The straight and narrow path that leads to life, which few find. And how about another individual? David, King David. The thought registered to him at one time, it's recorded in 2 Samuel. In chapter 11. Let me just go over there. I'll just read a few verses from there in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Beginning in verse 1, it, it, it says that in the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth with battle and so on, he remained in Jerusalem. And verse 2 says it happened, you know, and one evening that David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. If the Bible says a woman is beautiful, you, you better believe she is. Now, the graphic that you're probably seeing there, this is the uh, PG-5 version that I could find for today. Doesn't actually depict her. But she was beautiful, and he inquired, he sent someone to find out about her, and the man said that, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him, and he says that he slept with her after she had purified herself from her uncleanness. And you know the rest of the story, she conceived and she told him that she was pregnant and David was faced with a situation here. And he sent to get Uriah because he wanted to get Uriah to go and sleep with his wife so it would appear that he actually got her pregnant. But Uriah, who was one of his greatest warriors, refused. And so David had a problem and he had Uriah sent up to the front of the line and to be killed. How did David get to that point? It says that he saw her and he, I guess he thought that, wow, she's beautiful. I need to have this woman. But how could the king of Israel, how could this man who's read the, the scriptures come to that point in time where he, he would think such a thought. Didn't he know that he was wrong? Of course he did. James 1 and verse 14 gives an indication of just how we could get to that point. It says that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own evil desires and enticed. David had his evil desire. He was enticed to not only look upon her, but to have her. Verse 15, it says, And after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. We are drawn away, we become trapped. David was trapped, and he ended up trapping Uriah as well to his death. But he later wrote some of the more humbling, searching words you can find anywhere in Scripture. 
Jeff referred to one of them as well in, in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I believe in verse 10. I'll just go to verse 10, really, because I think Jeff stopped at verse 9 in his presentation. And David records this. He said, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And he wanted the joy of his salvation to be restored, as verse 12 says. But he also inspired Psalm 139 and if you go to verse 23 we read it he says to search me O God to know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts to point out in me anything that offends you and to lead me to the path of everlasting life it's like he wants a searchlight on his life he wants God to find out the things that are he cannot see himself because he does not have the vision to see it. And he's in a dark place and only God could point out those anxious thoughts, those thoughts. I guess in that moment it would probably would have been better for David to be like suddenly blinded and not see Bathsheba. He would save himself a lot of trouble. Matthew 5 actually kind of depicts that scenario in verse 28 and 29. Where Jesus in, inspired these words, he said, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Hmm. Then he goes on to say, If your right eye causes you to sin, Pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Hmm. If that were the case today, literally, there would be a lot of blind men walking around today. That graphics actually shows a few who probably would have lost both eyes. I guess the indication is then, he doesn't say to pluck out the other eye, but the indication is you would have learned the lesson by plucking out the first one, right? How many people would have wanted to lose both eyes if that were really literal? They'll probably need as many eyes as you have hairs on your head. You know, I guess me and Jeff would be in a little trouble because we don't have that, as many as some people. But if David had used the spirit which God gave him to work with him and the knowledge from the scriptures that the thing that he was thinking was wrong, that he could overcome that thought in that moment, it would be a different outcome. If perhaps he heard a voice behind him telling him, David, don't even think about it, the outcome could be different. But sometimes... Because we're in the flesh, our own evil desires win out that battle of the mind. And we fall prey. And we willfully sin. To overcome sin, in some cases, it's as simple as just walking away from the balcony. Or walking away from the roof. So why the tests? Why do we go through these tests? God allows us to be tested. God wants to see the character that we're building. It's very important for him to know what's in our heart. And we can learn to turn down the pleasures of sin. Our Savior himself was tempted by the devil. And Matthew 4 actually records that whole scenario after he, was, he came out up out of the waters of baptism himself. Matthew 4, I probably, I don't know if I have a slide, I think I do have a slide for verse 1 or verse 4. But it's, it speaks of Jesus coming up out of the waters 
you know, with the Spirit. And that he was fasting, he was hungry. And the devil came to him and he, he said to him, If you are the Son of Man, command these stones to become bread. You're hungry. And what did he say? He says, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It also used the word whenever he's tempted in verse 7. He said, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. And when Satan wanted him to worship him so he could give him all these things, he said, verse 10, that you are to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He used the word every single time he was tested. And Hebrews 4 Verse 15 tells us that he was really tested just like we are. Because it says we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He didn't sin. We have... A great high priest. So that's why it says in verse 16 that let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. It is there to help us. And the highest stakes were there for Christ while on the earth. You know, it says in, in Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame for us. And he was so concerned about that, that Hebrews 5 also talks about that he prayed, he cried to the one who could save him from death. The stakes are high because if he failed, we'd all be dead in our trespasses and sins. So we need to grasp the gravity of the situation as he did. How are we going to teach others in his kingdom if we're not learning to walk the right way? If we're not learning to do it now ourselves? We're all strong on the Sabbath. We're all super Christians on the Sabbath and the Holy Days. But is it the decisions that we make hour after hour, day after day, in between the Sabbaths, which are actually going to be critical? John 17 and verse 15, Jesus prayed this prayer. And he says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That old serpent of old is still here. James 1, 27 talks about how pure religion is. That we, how we walk, how we should visit orphans, how we should visit widows in their affliction, but also keep ourselves unspotted or unstained from the world. Our God doesn't leave us defenseless at all. We have the armor of God, and He gives us tools, none more important than the Holy Spirit or as essential as His Word. And we need to be obedient, and we need to get back to reading and meditating on His Word, because it is a great place to start to frame the thoughts that we think and prevent any unwholesome thoughts from entering our heart and our mind or our adversary. Can try to trap us. James 4 and verse 7 to 8 gives us a step here. It says, To submit ourselves then to God, to resist the devil, and he will flee. 
come near to God and he will come near to you. We are to submit and draw near to God. Just as Christ showed by his example and to use his word. It says to cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. So that really is the heart of the matter. We are double-minded. We are trying to serve two masters. We are trying to follow God, but still give room for our own evil desires. And we lose focus and thereby make the wrong choices. Wouldn't it be great to be 100% correct all the time when we have the right answer for a situation and we have the correct direction to go in before making a, a major decision? And what if we knew that if we followed that step all the time, we would have the absolute best outcome all the time. And we know then we'd have to willingly disobey in order to have some other outcome. Prophetically, there is a time coming where this will be so. Where this serpent will also be bound for a thousand years. But for us, we have to start now. Isaiah chapter 30 tells us of a time like this to come. It says in verse 19 to 21, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee, at the voice of thy cry, when he shall hear, he will answer thee. And though the Lord will give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And when you turn to the left, Thine eye shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. And when you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left, that's what you'll hear. This is the way, walk ye in it. So are we ignoring that voice? Are we not drawing near to God so He can draw near to us? That inner battle is always present while we're here in the flesh. James 4 says in verse 1 to 4, it says, What causes these quarrels and these fights among you? Is it not the things, this thing that your passions are at war within you? Your desire and you do not have, so you murder. Cain murdered, David. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. It says you are an adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 2 Corinthians 10 records here what I think is one of the most difficult scriptures in the follow in the in the in the in the word to follow. One of the most difficult things to achieve. Verse four and five it starts out saying, as Paul would explain here, how this is possible to do. It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. For casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Christ used the word to cast down the arguments that Satan brought to him. And Satan tried to exalt himself above the knowledge of God. And it says, bringing every thought into captivity 
It allows us to do that. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Think about how many thoughts we're told we, we have every day. You yourselves know how many thoughts. Maybe your thoughts even strayed during the sermon. Maybe you said, when is this going to be over? Don't even think about it. I'm just saying. But the Greek word that's used for thought there is dianoia. D-I-A-N-O-I-A. Dianoia. It's a very interesting word because it's, it's used to describe the things we think, the things which hold our minds captive. It means to thoroughly think from side to side, which means you're using your mind to come up with the permutations of what a decision is. It's critical thinking, literally, through reasoning. And it incorporates both sides of a matter, so till we come to a meaningful conclusion. Critical thinking would mean we're thinking about the outcome of the thought and what would happen if, the, if we go in with that action. Had David been using that? He'd have realized that if he allowed this thought to become not just registered, he would see that he would get in trouble with God and also he would do an evil thing in Israel. It's very important to think wisely, to bring those thoughts to the obedience of Christ that we realize that our thoughts do not offend God and are not offensive to Him. So let's get back to the value of things now. How do we build character? Do we value God's knowledge? Do we value His plan for us? that we make our thoughts align with his values. Matthew 13 gives a parable of this pearl of great price. Jesus tells them and he says again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who's in search of fine pearls as like you see in the graphic there. When he finds this one great pearl this pearl of great value. He went and he sold all that he had and bought it. Hebrews 2, verse 1 to 3, tells us something that we should value, just like that great pearl. It says, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. For since the message declared by angels pro proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? How? We have this opportunity now to value this great salvation like that pearl of great price, to think about it, to make sure our actions and our thoughts do not make us stray away. Moses had an opportunity while he was here on the earth to enjoy the pleasures of sin. But Hebrews says, by faith, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Rather, he chose to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for you look forward to a reward and that reward is coming from our Heavenly Father he didn't choose he didn't want the pleasures of sin and we shouldn't either Hebrews 11 the faith chapter also records in verse 15 about some people here and it says of these 
who people who look forward to something else. It says, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they desired a better country. That is such a quite a contrast to those who, 3,000 who died, who wanted to create their own gods to bring them out of Egypt. Now, the opening video, as I get ready to wrap up here, it was a very simple concept. Simple, but it can teach a great lesson. It was a small defenseless boy facing a giant of a man who wants to take his precious drink. And he used words, don't even think about it, which to him were able to subdue that giant of a man. The word of God to us is bigger than any giant. It is greater than the devil himself, as Christ showed. So even more than talking about the precious drink, how about our precious salvation? Literally drinking that soda will make you thirsty again. But drinking in Christ and His Spirit, we will never thirst. Maybe eternal life is not as precious to us as we claim. For if it is, we will show it by our actions. So put your defenses up, brethren, and use even these words, don't even think about it, as part of your resistance. Part of the resistance for when the temptations come and when the giants are in your way. Revelation 3, verse 11 says to let no one take your crown. You know, Christ says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold on to what, that you, what you have. Let no one take it. Don't turn here. Don't turn there. Stand the straight and narrow. That pathway that leads to truth and life. And follow Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let your adversary know, when they face you, don't even think about it. Now, normally I would close with the ironic blessing, but today I will, I will close with a prophetic scripture and a song. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Don't even think about that. But hopefully this song will be a blessing to you on this, this Sabbath. Micah 6 and verse 8 prophetically tells us of what God really expects of us. And he says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Go on and walk humbly with your God and enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. There's a song, it's entitled, This is the Way Walk In It by Dave and Jess Ray. Go on, turn your volume up and enjoy this song and see you on another Sabbath. Shalom.
And trust me and 